Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Future States Focus. My name is Dr. Joseph Orozco. I'm a professor of philosophy at Oregon State University. And I'm also the co-director of the Inari's Project for Alternative Futures. The Inari's Project is a forum for conversations, initiatives, and projects that imagine a future free of exploitation, domination, oppression, war, and empire. One of our projects that we do at the Inari's Project is this one, Future States Focus, in which we take a deep dive look at episodes from the PBS series Future States that appeared a few years ago. Future States was an effort by ITVS TV in which they provided a grant to various directors, primarily uh, BIPOC directors, to imagine what the future of the United States might look at. And uh, there were uh, a variety of different seasons from between 2011 to 2014. And so we've been taking a look at some of these episodes and trying to see what relevance they have for our world today and the kind of futures that they project. And in order to help me look through some of these, uh, I have uh, my uh, able co-host, Robin Morris. Hey. hey <laughs> Robin is, uh, well, tell us about what, what's, uh, wh where do you work at, Robin? What do you teach? What do you do? Um, well, right now I'm teaching at St. Xavier University in Chicago, Illinois. Um, I teach an intro level course to philosophy, intro to philosophy. It's called the Examined Life. And um, generally what I focus on is asking my students to think about what justice means. So. We start out essentially with the apology, Socrates and the apology, and then we move on to um, ethical theory and then contemporary issues. And by the end of the course, I, you know, I have them say, tell me what, what justice is to them, what it looks like, what a just society should look like, that sort of thing. Right on. Very appropriate for the kind of stuff that we do here with Future States Focus, where we try to unpack these stories. So this is episode four for us of Future States Focus. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to think about it the other day, and I was like, oh, man, I guess it is four now. It doesn't yeah, seem we, like it's been that many. Yeah, no. And there, I mean, there's four seasons of this, so there's a lot to sort of unpack still to, and, and to go through. But uh, we have two episodes today that I think are really interesting to, to focus in on. Um, uh, the first one that we're going to look at is That Which Once Was. And uh, the second one is Digital Antiquities. And both of these episodes focus on the question about the importance of memory and identity, right? So how does cultural and personal identity uh, or memory affect identity? And so I, I think that uh, both of these pair together uh, help us to sort of ask the kind of questions about what sort of memories do we want to preserve today to think about this kind of question of justice? So um, I think what we're going to do is to begin with uh, the episode, That Which Once Was, and uh, one of the things that Future States, uh, the program did is they built, they made uh, a couple of um, 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 trailers for some of the seasons uh, that they were working on. So I wanted to share for those of you who are on our uh, uh, video log, the trailer for that which once was to give you a sense of uh, the characters and who they are. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, who, um, who the actors were and who the directors were for this particular episode. So this is the uh, trailer from Future States for That Which Once Was. This premiered on PBS uh, in May of 2011. So this is pretty short. Uh, it's th That Which Once Was.
Okay. So that was the trailer for That Which Once Was. Um, Robin, could you tell us a little bit about what this episode was about? Sure. Um, that The little boy that you see is our main character. His name is Vincente. He is um, from an unknown Caribbean uh, island. And he is a survivor of what sounds like a catastrophic uh, tsunami, which took out his family, his village, um, his entire community. And now he's what's called a climate refugee. Um, he has something that's probably pretty similar to post-traumatic stress disorder. You see in the trailer that he, you know, he gets sprayed with water and he screams out. And that's because, you know, there's probably still a lot of trauma connected with water in and of itself. Um, he, you saw him break the ice sculpture there and part of his restitution for breaking this thing is he works with that ice sculptor and um, the ice sculptor's name is Inok. I'm pretty sure that's his name. And he is also a climate refugee and he sculpts ice sort of as a way of keeping his memories alive and um, material in some sort of way. Uh, and they be, they become really close and, they seem to, they cope together. They help each other, I think, cope. So that's the gist of that one. Yeah, this, that, thank you. That, that was, uh, this is uh, uh, one of the early seasons from season two. This is season two, episode 10. Um, and the director for this, as we saw, is uh, Kimi Takasue. Uh, Kimi Takasue currently is the, uh, an associate professor of art, culture, and media at Rutgers University, Newark. And uh, one of the reasons that I chose this particular episode was that this is uh, one of the big favorites uh, for future states. It uh, won an award for best short film at the Barcelona Environmental Film Festival and was uh, an award winner for ITVS. Uh, the audience apparently really, really enjoyed this particular short. It's really well done. Mm. Um, and uh, the principal characters are um, uh, Vicente, uh, portrayed by the young man Vicente Otero, who I think uh, has not gone on to acting. I haven't been able to find any evidence that he went on for, uh, to continue acting after this, even though he was really good, mm -hmm. uh, as you point out. Um, and we can talk about that. Uh, the, the ice sculptor actor uh, is an Inuit actor, um, and he's actually a, a real ice sculptor. Uh, his name is Natar Ungalak uh, and has uh, portrayed different characters in Canadian films, um, but has gone on and done some things in, um, in Canada. And so, right, as you're pointing out, Robin, this is a film that's set in 2032, I think, uh, 2032. Yeah. 2032. And so this is a period in which uh, the, I guess the ice caps have, melted and this has inundated the world right so the world of that which once was is one in which there are all these environmental refugees and you can tell who they are because they have these tattoos uh, on their arms uh, that says something like er then a number and so apparently it seems what's gone on in the united states is that uh, we have been inundated uh, so to speak, with all these environmental refugees from all around the world. And both the characters are environmental refugees, one from the north, apparently. So it seems that all the, uh, at one point, uh, 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 right, Anouk says that the ice has all disappeared. And so his, his whole family too was wiped out. Mm -hmm. uh, you see at one point, right, Vincente going through some of his stuff in the workshop. Uh, and there's a, a photograph of uh, a young man. You take, he must be his son or family mm -hmm. that got killed uh, when the ice melted. And then Vincente, who is from some Caribbean ocean that, or uh, Caribbean island that got uh, swamped over by the rising sea tides. And he, uh, Vicente, is a part of a group of young people who are uh, in a social service welfare agency for environmental refugees in some big major American city. 
<laughs> and part of their life is just learning how to deal with the trauma that they've lived in. And so there's a couple of really poignant scenes where we talk, where we can see, you know, Vicente talking about or dealing with his uh, PTSD with social workers and with doctors and healthcare uh, personnel. And it's, it's, a tr it's tragic to see what's happened to this young man, mm -hmm. right? So we were talking about how the portrayal of PTSD in him is really uh, quite vivid. I think one of the first scenes that comes out at you is where uh, you see him, he, they, they're painting uh, uh, watercolors or something uh, together as a, a group of the children in this, this foster home. Uh, and uh, he's cleaning up and he becomes transfixed by the water just building up in this sink and he just, mm -hmm. he, he just can't do anything about it and he just watches it rise and then start to pour out over the sink and he's just trans, you know, fixed, frozen. Uh, you know, just frozen in this, this watching this water level rise and you s see also, you know, in his time at the, at the home, his memories of an ocean, right? And sounds of the sea keep haunting his dreams. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a couple of scenes like that, which are uh, sort of showing that he's had a lot of uh, pain and suffering in his life and he's still trying to figure out how to deal with it. In the trailer, you see some of the kids spray him with a hose and he, he, he won't have it. Mm -hmm. And so that depiction uh, is uh, really, really rich. I think of the, the sort of pain of this uh this young man right uh and we had talked prior but one of the things that stuck out to me you know i'm a i'm a veteran of foreign wars so uh this this portray portrayal of someone so young and so vulnerable struggling the way that i do and my fellow veterans do was shocking to me um just there's a scene where he's visiting the doctor and the doctor asks him, what can I do you do for you? And, um, Vincente says, uh, I can't, I can't sleep. I have nightmares, you know, and the doctor says, well, can you tell me about one? And Vincente will not tell him. And then it's, and then the doctor is just like, here's your medication. Don't take more than two at a time. I mean, the kid is like, eight years old it's shocking enough that he has to be given that kind of medication let alone be in charge of that medication on top of it because he has no family now to look after him you know yeah what uh what really um what really shocked me about that like you said right is the doctor's not only giving him meds right uh in this way but right as you pointed out it's sort of unsupervised right they the the social worker or whoever the group home uh, work uh, person who's in control of these children is not there at the at the medical uh appointment and so uh Vicente has to um, administer the pills to himself mm -hmm. right? and sort of it gives you a kind of a sense that uh these children are being taken care of with very minimal supervision they sort of have to take care of themselves and so i think it shows the sort of kind of like how precarious the the, the situation is for treating these children right taking care of them it's like society is sort of begrudgingly taking care of them and giving them you know rather than having to really deal with their um their trauma they're being medicated to sort of forget it to mm -hmm. sur suppress it right and so you you see them trying to talk about it at the beginning but if they don't want to they're not pushed to talk about it anyway so we is not getting really any kind of supervision or therapy for the loss of his community and his parents right uh, at least his father we see at some point in the film uh, apparently dead from mm -hmm. the tsunami so rather than try to help them deal with their trauma they are being asked to suppress it uh, right and there's that the whole uh going off of the lack of care right there is a point in this short where someone calls into the radio station mm -hmm. um and they say what's with you know he's saying uh, I don't like the fact that my tax dollars are having to take care of all these climate refugees. We have enough problems. We have to stop being the world police, right? We have to take care of our own people. That stuck out to me, both because it's the lack of empathy, right? The lack of care for your fellow person, 
but also the sheer amount of privilege you must have to take that kind of a view um, where everyone in the United States contributes vastly more to climate change than the richest people in the Caribbean, than mm -hmm. the richest Inuits, right? And these people are going to be the ones who are first to suffer, who are first to feel these effects. And we are privileged enough to be sort of insulated from those effects, even though we're the ones causing them, you know? I mean, on the whole. Yeah, I think the, uh, the, the, the film does this really well, uh, sort of showing like how this, is, this process of creating these refugees is just ongoing. So not only do you have the, the children who it looks like most of them are from Caribbean nations. There's one other kid who has like a Jamaica t-shirt in, mm -hmm. in among uh, the group that Vincente has at this home, right? And so there's that, there's the Inuit uh, sculptor, right? But uh, another scene you see some uh, refugees out on the street begging for money uh, and out on the street you see discarded newspapers with headlines that say something about like uh, flooding in Bangladesh. And right. in the background, there's radio noise, too, about um, continuing uh, rising sea levels and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So in the middle of this, uh, this story, there's this continual uh, danger to human communities all around the world that are being continually being displaced by climate change. And the debate going on, it seems, in the United States is like, well, are my tax dollars really going to uh, deal with people who deserve it? Mm -hmm. So that kind of sense of the disconnect that a lot of Americans tend to have about um, whether or not climate change affects them in any kind of sense. You know, right. I've looked at surveys about climate change. It's really interesting. There have been a whole variety in the past 10 years about whether or not people in the United States feel that uh, global warming or climate change, however the term is, is going to change, whether or not it's going to affect them in any kind of way. And what's interesting about these surveys over and over and over again is that they, they, they show that Americans tend to think, well, you know, this is going to be a big deal for people in developing countries. It's going to be a big deal for people in the global south. And then you, if you keep asking these kinds of questions, like, do you think it's going to affect you uh, personally? Right. Usually uh, the last uh, survey I saw about this was about five years or so ago. And uh, the most Americans, like two thirds of Americans said, I don't really think it's going to have much effect on me, but it's going to be a big deal on other people. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there's this kind of, and also, you know, big deal for animals and for plant life. And it's going to affect everybody except me and the people who are uh, around me. Uh, and so these, this kind of disconnect of the effects of climate change uh, in at least the American sort of worldview are really stark and interesting mm -hmm. to see. And you see that playing out in this, in this where right, most of the refugees are uh, folk of color, mm -hmm. uh, brown and black folk trying to deal with uh, the effects of this. And what's interesting about this, right? I think, uh, as you pointed out, that uh, what this episode really is about is memory. Um, because um, the Inuit sculptor is trying to maintain a cultural practice, right, of these ice sculptures, of trying to make beautiful things out of the ice, which doesn't exist anymore in mm -hmm. his home, right? And there's a real poignant scene where he and Vicente are talking about uh, memory and Vicente is sort of saying, you know, like, why do you do this? What's the point of making these ice sculptures? And uh, he replies, there, no there is no point to it. There's no goal. It's just to do. And Vicente, ha you know, there's this conversation where Vicente says, you know, like, why, why keep this going? It's not real. It's not, not solid. It all, it all melts. It all melts away. And, uh, uh, and the sculptor replies, you know, it's if you remember it, right, you can keep it real in that way. And th this is really interesting uh, to talk about, like, cultural memory. I think a lot of different kinds of agencies are, are recognizing the effects of cultural change, not just on human lives, but on culture, right? And so I was looking into this a little bit, and um, the... It, it seems like the United Nations is looking very carefully about this question about what the damage climate change could be for culture. 
So part of the Paris Agreement in 2015 was um, a section that they called the Agenda for Sustainable Development. And they recognize that uh, climate change is going to be a significant damage to cultural sustainability. So not only is it a danger to you know, actual life and uh, territory, but to cultural memory. Mm -hmm. And what, the, the, what they tried to do in the Agenda for Sustainable Development is they recognize that people's adaptation to what, cult, what climate change will do is going to be a challenge, but that recognizing how to adapt the world to climate change is going to be a goal uh, for dealing with climate change. And one of the resources that the United Nations recognizes through the Paris Agreement is this idea of, of uh, culture material culture and ideas as a, a resource for what they call resilience. So the United Nations is trying to develop programs and trying to figure out ways in which culture can be preserved, even though communities get displaced and land and territory disappear. How do we maintain cultural resources that will allow peoples to be resilient and remain. This is going to be mm -hmm. a big challenge in the future. And you see this coming out in this, this short about like how the Inuit have had their land and communities destroyed. And they're trying to hold on to these cultural practices that remind them of who they once were. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's very sad. I think it illustrates like another disconnect um, between American society and many other cultures around the world, right? Um, I don't think that American culture is uh, tied to a land in a particular way or tied to animals or particular plants or um, various sorts of practices that rely on this land these plants these animals you know and um and so that just fuels this sort of unempathetic approach to a loss of culture for other people it makes it hard to understand what that could mean or how devastating that actually is for a person you know if you told me robin you can't live in chicago anymore i'd be like okay <laughs> I guess I'll just go live somewhere else. That's fine. But if you tell someone or people like, say, the Inuits, you can't live on this land anymore, that represents a huge loss uh, in, in various sorts of ways. Um, so it's, you know, and you and I have talked about this as a white person in general, it's hard for me to understand cultural loss in that way because part of buying into whiteness is having to give up your culture in a lot of ways you know my family we tell stories about being irish but i don't know what that actually means to be irish um in the same way that that inuit man knows what it means concretely to be an inuit right there is something tying him to that identity um but for me, for my family, we've lost that memory. We don't have that sort of cultural memory anymore. Um, and that I think is true for many, many Americans is they've been forced to give up those cultural memories. They don't know what it means to be German, what it means to be English or wherever else they came from, Italian or, you know, whatever. Um, they, they're sort of pushed into an American culture and then you know, I don't really know what even that means. I mean, I know the answer is I should give. But <laughs> well, yeah, we know. talked about this. We talked about this in one of our previous episodes, uh, white, when we talk about right what white identity means. But I think you're right. I think what this, uh, what's interesting about this is that uh, you see the main kind of protagonist in this Vicente and, and and Enoch, right? Both of them are people tied to particular kinds of places and how their their identities have been shaped by being where they're from. So in Vicente's case, right, the token that he has to sort of remind him about where he was is this fishing lure mm -hmm. that he used when he, he has a memory at the end of him and his father fishing along an ocean. 
And so uh, the fishing lure reminds him of that life. And for Enoch, right, is the, the, the sculpting is his cultural practice of keeping the memory of his culture alive tied to that particular kind of place. Mm -hmm. And so for many indigenous folk, right, the, 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 the idea of memory must be tied to place, right, is deeply tied to place. And so what's interesting about, you know, one thing I wanted to say about this, right, is that, you know, there's all these agreements uh, that the UN is doing, like the Paris Agreement that are talking about threat, threats to culture because of climate change. One thing that indigenous people have been saying over and over and over again is when we talk about apocalypse, whose apocalypse are we talking about? Yeah. Um, different uh, uh, Native American philosophers have been talking in the past uh, 20 years or so about trying to recognize that the idea of apocalypse as the end of civilization is a kind of settler colonialist mentality, right? This kind of worry about the end of times is a particular kind of worry of a certain group of people because indigenous folks have already experienced their yep. apocalypse, right? They, they are currently, right, uh, uh, for many of them, they're living already in the dystopia of their, their civilization, right? This is the left, this is their Mad Max, right? This is right. Right, living in the United States as it's currently constructed. And so trying to think about this imagination of like, what is this place and what are the memories that we need to preserve is really important, I think, going on. Um, because it, it ties, uh, the, the, the question about memory is tied to place. And it's also this question about the future, right? Because memory can not only affect who you are now, but where you want to go or who you want to be in the future. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there are these, there's multiple different kinds of stories going on about um, how we should think about our memory right now. Um, one way I think we can sort of bring this more in is to think about the, the next um, episode that we talked about uh, called Digital Antiquities. And so um, why don't we share the, um, the trailer for Digital Antiquities um, and then we can talk a little bit about um, what this episode brings to our discussion about place, memory, and identity. So here's the trailer for Digital Antiquities. So that's the, um, the trailer for Digital Antiquities. That premiered in April of 2011. So, so Robin, what happens in Digital Antiquities? Um, Digital Antiquities, you've got Kat. Um, she's our female protagonist, and she, uh, she runs sort of a, a store that sells Digital Antiquities, but also helps people... Um, restored data off of various kinds of digital antiquities, right? This is set so far into the future that, you know, the laptops that we're recording on right now would be a digital antiquity. Um, and our male protagonist enters her store and he has a CD and he needs her help to try and um, build something that will read the CD for him. His name is Kai. She at first says, I can't help you. Well, she says, this will be expensive. He says, I don't have the money. She says, I can't help you, bye. <laughs> and um, that night, she actually lives in her shop that night, Kai breaks in and, um, and he, you know, she says the police will be here any minute. And he says, look, I know what's going on here. I'm not leaving until you help me. And essentially what's happened is, is for decades, um, and this takes place in what Eastern Pennsylvania. So for decades, 
New York and New Jersey have been dumping their um, electronic waste in this area and her shop is sort of built on this landfill and um, what her and her father would do is they created these tunnels into the landfill so that they can extract um, various things and then sell them as digital antiquities as like artifacts of a bygone era right and so um she sees that she's sort of and this is all illegal so she sees she's sort of caught at this time so she takes him down into the tunnels and teaches him the kind of drive that she needs in order to build a cd drive um he ends up inadvertently causing a tunnel collapse and that's when we find out her father died in a in a similar tunnel collapse and so she's all alone um so they make it back to the surface and she builds this drive for him and they find out actually that his mom who had died and gifted him the cd is actually her mom too and they are half half brother and sister at the end so yeah this is a this is a really interesting um film uh, one thing i just wanted to comment on was like how fantastic the set is for uh this short that tunnel i don't know yeah. how they did that because it's not like uh, i was trying to look at it and i don't think it's cgi but it goes on quite a long ways right that they're that they have to go on and right the tunnel is just like underneath this huge landfill of like all this equipment and it's like you know all this stuff is like piled on top of it but the scenes that they have you know the, the especially when the lights come on when uh, when cat is showing him the tunnels it goes on for a while so i was like wow they really did a, a number on this set mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's really interesting so the director for this one is uh jp chan and from what i can tell he uh um He's currently the multimedia director for the uh, Metropolitan Transportation Agency in New York for the MTA. So I guess he designs uh, a lot of their, their uh, advertising. And um, uh, what, what I found interesting about this film was that he, uh, the short at least, this came out in 2011, like I said, he took the basic premise of this short and he built it up into a full feature length film that came out in 2013 called A Picture of You. And I told Robin, I uh, told you a little bit about this uh, movie before, but I won't give too much about it away. But similar sort of premise, right, is that a, a brother and sister, fi uh, their mother passes away and they are tasked with having to go to her house to clean out all her things so that they can sell the house. And at one point they have to look through her old um, uh, computer and to download any information that they need. And what they do is they find uh, just three photographs of their mother uh, in uh, sort of compromising. Questionable? Yeah, I, I, question, well, sexual. They find yeah. evidence of their mom as this sexual being. Uh, they, they see some pictures of, of, a, of a man's body and uh, a man's penis, and then a picture of, uh, their mom in a negligee and so they try to figure out like well why does mom have these pictures and who is this person and so the rest of the film is an attempt to try to locate who the man is in the film in the in the photograph so that they can determine like what who their mother was seeing right why did this mother think that these were important photographs to have and the whole the whole experience changes their understanding of their mother and to some extent of them too. Um, uh, there's a really funny scene where the, uh, the brother, um, after they've found the, the photographs, the, uh, he is talking to the sister and uh, her friends who have come to join them at the house. And they're, uh, they're smoking a joint together and he's like, hey, give me some of that. And apparently, I guess he's like to be the real sort of tight laced kind of brother. And they're like, well, you know, like, well, do you smoke? Like, what's going on? And, and the, I, he gives some line to the effect of like, well, if mom was able to be all carefree and crazy, I might as well be too. <laughs> so it creates this kind of like dissonance in his identity of who he was to realize that his mom 
was sexual, but not only sexual, was holding on to like the photographs of her uh, identity in this kind of way. And it turns out that her mom had a really interesting kind of sexual life that they had no awareness of. And so it's similar, the premise is similar to Digital Antiquities here where you find that um, Cat, portrayed by Joe uh, May, uh, is half brothers with Kai, Corey Hawkins. Um, the actor Corey Hawkins. And so it's interesting. Joe Mai uh, went on, of course, to a picture of you. She's been in Bones, uh, Good Wife, um, and other independent films. Corey Hawkins has gone on really successfully to a lot of different films. He was uh, in, uh, most recently, the film Straight Outta Compton. He was Dr. Dre, which I think was a really good portrayal if you haven't seen that film before. He's been in The Walking Dead, uh, played uh, a role in the film Kong, and uh, I was really surprised about this because I had no way I'd seen his face before, but I hadn't put it all together. And he's looking a little bit older, of course, now. But he played uh, Kwame Ture, uh, Stokely Carmichael, uh, in uh, the Spike Lee film Black Klansman, uh, which is a really interesting film to check out. So he's gone on to some really interesting things. But right, this film is interesting because it's, it's again, this kind of question about like our memories and how do our memories affect who we are? And in this case, what's happened is both of these characters thought they knew who they were. And then through being able to access this data uh, that they didn't know exactly existed, their whole lives are changed. And they are different people at the end of the short. And so this raises some really interesting questions about like identity again, because it's possible that memories can really disrupt your life in a big way and open up possibilities for being very different kinds of people. Right. I think that that's interesting that they, they gained a new identity in that, oh, now I'm a brother and now I'm a sister, you know, this whole thing. One of the things that stuck out to me is um, Kat has this line where she says, um, She's talking about how her clientele are generally these older people. You know, she says um, they're old, they're at the end of their life, full of regret, and they come to me with these old like flash drives and whatnot. And they, you know, they want to remember what once was. And, um, and she says, but I think that if it doesn't stay in the heart or the mind, it's meant to be lost. Um, and that stuck out to me in regard to, you know, the other short that we watched. And the idea here is Kat is saying, oh, well, maybe those cultures are meant to be lost. Like if they can't just stay in your heart and your mind, they're, then they're meant to be lost. But I wonder then about the transmission, right, of culture from one person to the next, this change that happens. So. And I don't have the answers. It's just something that stuck out to me from that film, thinking about the other one, is if it doesn't stay in your heart and your mind, then it was meant to be lost. And I wonder if now she feels differently. Now she knows, hey, I have a brother, and I would have never known that had we not created or somehow figured out a way to transmit these memories to me. Yeah, I mean, I, that's the sense I get from this is because, you know, at the beginning of this, she sort of has her humdrum life and, you know, you see her uh, alone in this shop that was apparently her father's shop beforehand. And she's just sort of going through the motion, trying to make ends meet, um, trying to evade detection of the fact that, you know, should they have this underground tunnel with all this garbage that they're using. But, you know, she's also looking through some of her old photographs, right, of her uh, her father, at least, and she doesn't know her mother. So she has a gap in her life mm -hmm. uh, that she didn't know about. And when Kai wanders in with this and uh, sees like a photograph that is on this disc that he got from uh, his mother, right, that it's one of the same photographs that she was looking at earlier, right? And so it's like, you know, that's where they have this moment of recognition that they are related to each other and that their mother was the person that was holding them together in this way. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I, I read it as that she had a very kind of... Um, Cynical. 
yeah cynical like the past was something really harmful for her or hurtful right is that her mother was something in the past and really didn't have anything to add to her life now but the story got filled up when kai showed these images that showed that her mother was someone who you know we don't know exactly why she was with um kai's father or what mm -hmm. that story was there's a whole bunch of story that was buried right just like the garbage of new york and and new jersey that has a whole different life to itself right so again it's this kind of question of suppression right that we talked about before right is that uh in that which once was the climate refugees are being uh, encouraged in some sense to suppress their memories of their lives and the trauma that they experience don't deal with the messiness and you know, Vincente is learning how to express his pain through building and remembering. Uh, similar sort of things going on here in uh, digital antiquities, right, is that uh, she was trying to suppress her stories and then there's a release then mm. with uh, the appearance of Kai in her life, that there's a new story about who she is and what she might be right and i think that this is tied to the question that you were raising before about like uh, particularly white folk right and identity in that kind of way because as you were saying white folk coming to the united states the story is of the american dream of the melting pot is that if you give up your memory of where you came from your homeland you can be an american but it depends on adopting american identity which is typically a white sort of identity and if you can adopt this identity then it means that you forget the story of your past and you take on a new story. And uh, there's so much loss there. And I think both these stories are saying that uh, that, that kind of loss is, is, comes at a very high cost uh, and that maybe there's something about trying to fight to preserve the past in a way that can be healing uh, mm -hmm. and is also about new possibilities in the future. Right. Uh, the way that I thought That's about right. thinking, thinking about this was that particularly, I mean, we're at a moment right now in society where we're thinking about these kinds of questions about like our identity and our memory, right? In the past, you know, five years or so, there's been all these questions about Confederate statues and uh, uh, names of buildings on universities and street names and cities and all this kind of question of like, how do we want to maintain buildings that publicly memorialize people that had questionable uh, ethics or in some cases had very definite ties to racial terrorism and to the Confederate cause. Um, and within the past year or so, we've seen you know this come to a head with all the Black Lives Matter uh, protests in which some of these statues have just simply come down. Mm -hmm. And and the and the point is that we don't want to honor these. We don't want to have memory of these people in public any longer. Uh, and to continue to have memories of these people is harmful to people in our community. And we want to build new communities with new stories. And that means building new new space in our stories of who we are. And it means erasing certain kinds of memories to to a certain extent, right? Or at least yeah. not memorializing. Right. That's what I was going to say. I don't think it's necessarily about erasing the memory itself or erasing history. That's often the critique that gets raised, right? Oh, well, if we don't remember those who don't, you know, they always use that one line. Those who don't remember the past are doomed to repeat it or whatever. Um, I, I think it's more about remembering in the right way. Um, having memories that reflect the reality of it, right? Um, General Lee is not a great person. Um, he did terrible things. So that why we would, why would we, would we remember him in a way that sort of glorifies him, right? Puts him on a pedestal, um, deifies him almost, right? Like puts him above all of us. And it's, there are ways to remember someone like Robert E. Lee without having to make him into some martyr, some hero, you know, any of that. Because obviously it is important for us to remember these things, but we need to remember them in the right way. We don't need to have 
Robert E. Lee's name on school on schools where black children go, right? Like that, that that's not a, the appropriate way. Um, right, and, and you know, and what's come out, of course, with a lot of these Confederate statues in so many different places is that they were not, they were erected in times that were not immediately after the Civil War and things right. like this, but they were done in the early part of the 20th century where there's this resurgent white supremacist movement through eu scientific eugenics. Mm -hmm. And part of it was uh, white communities wanting to reassert their control of, of uh, their communities in a Jim Crow uh, America by creating these material realities of the story that they wanted to tell about their past because by telling those story that particular story of the past it affected their present and then what that future society could be like right because now this is a white community right, right? And this is surrounded by our white heroes and so right this kind of question that you know has been raised by both of these these episodes about the importance of having material re, uh, representations and reality of one's culture is important and it's important to be able to maintain it for the resilience of the community but you can see that this gets then the question of like well what stories do we tell mm -hmm. there's, an, there's the element of justice in this is is that th this has to be a question about memory and the injustices that we portray that we perpetuate upon one another right and so i think that part of what we're seeing here with the uh, uh the, the episode is this kind of question about like how memories are not just about what happened in the past but what we want to happen in the future who we want to become Mm -hmm. and uh, this can be often a really disruptive um, a disruptive and painful realization that the past isn't really the way that we thought it was. And maybe that's what, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that it's, it's hard to sort of give too much credence to people who are like, let's hold on to the Confederacy, right? Uh, but I think that a lot of people have grown up with a certain kind of story uh, that, you know, the Confederate flag and all this stuff is, is about a certain kind of heritage. And I think both of these uh, episodes are suggesting that memories tell stories about a certain kind of way that things are, and they can be very powerful in terms of conditioning who we think we are now and want to be. And so I think that there's, there's a serious kind of question about how do, we, how do we deal with those stories in a responsible way attending to justice? And that's a, yeah. that's a complicated question. Right, but it starts with honesty. You know, we have to honestly remember these things. We have to honestly do, you know, do the research, do the work. And, and as painful as it is, own up to our own failings, you know. Um, you, can't, you can't start from a place of dishonesty. When you were talking about how the, a lot of these Confederate statues were actually built in the early 20th century. It reminded me of um, the Daughters of the Confederacy and the way that they had this huge movement to change history books, right? The history books that, you know, all of our children learn from to try and change the story of the Confederacy to this sort of antebellum, we're just fighting for states' rights, um, and, and uh, you know, all of these people are martyrs kind of story of the Civil War. And we're still dealing with that today. And that was just that movement to change all of our history books. And if it's that easy, it's that easy. Um, so I think the first step has to be honesty. It has to be ad admission and honesty in our, in our history, you know, owning up to our own history and saying, no, this is what happened. This is what we know happened. And there's good and there's really bad too. But we have to own all of it. We can't just cherry pick out the good parts and say, look it, here's what we've got for history. Look at all this good stuff. Because there's a ton of bad things too. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, when I think about this, I think uh, there's a, a writer that I really like, uh, Elizabeth Betita Martinez, who's a Chicana author. And um, in a lot of her work, she uh, talks about the importance of recognizing the origin myths upon which the United States is built. And uh, for her, right, one of them is, of course, recognizing uh, slavery, 
uh, and the, the uh, enslavement of African Americans. There is the deterritorialization of um, of uh, Mexican and other Latinx folks during a period of imperialism starting in 1846 with the United States. And then of course, the genocide of native peoples, right? And so for her, this, these are the sort of foundational myths of the United, uh, the stories of the United States that need to be dealt with. Oh. And it's still hard in history textbooks to get people to be exposed to these histories in any deep kinds of ways. Uh, and you see constantly the debates of this kind of history playing out in like textbooks, which textbooks will be adopted. But just last week, you know, we were talking about this before, um, President Trump made an announcement that uh, part of what's going on with all of these uprisings that have taken place in, in, since the spring of 2020 have been the result of indoctrination that he says is going on in our schools. Right, uh, that uh, uh, apparently, right, all these left wing teachers are telling stories that are too critical of the United States. And he wants to return to uh, what he calls patriotic education that emphasizes the importance of thinking about the United States as an exceptional place uh, and uh, a really important place. And so the idea here is that, you know, of course there are bad things happened, but they were more the uh, exception rather than the rule. And we need to honor the, the really important struggles and strides that have made the, the United States the, the best that it can be. So right now we're in this moment of cultural struggle over what memories do we want to preserve? Because depending on the memories that we have, they can really disrupt who we are now and who we might possibly be. Um, and uh, the possibilities of different kinds of relationships in the future are at stake in some sense. So I think that part of it is, do we wanna keep telling a story in the United States of the United States as this, you know, society of explorers and pioneers and people that change the world, which just turns out to be a story of white settler colonialists? Mm -hmm. Or do we want to complicate that story and figure out different kinds of relationships uh, that take into account the trauma? that that original story has uh, perpetuated on different people. Uh, and so I think, you know, that, that what some of these shorts show is that our immediate reaction to some of these painful kinds of memories is often to try to get rid of them or suppress them or to bury them as much as possible. Uh, and excavating those memories uh, is really important and, and, and people of color and different kinds of oppressed communities are holding on to uh, trying to, you know, preserve them in the face of huge destructive forces, right? So both of these are really, in some sense, kind of tragic episodes in that kind of way of a really perpetual struggle for who we want to be in the future. So even though these are about memory, this is really, again, about the future. Yeah. I agree. And, and it's something that we're all going to, we need to start dealing with now. It's like we, what you said, this has parallels to the struggles that we're facing here. I mean, it's hard not to think of uh, 1984 when you hear the president of the United States start talking about patriotic education. Um, but that's the struggle. That's where we're at. And that's really, that's why I love these episodes is because they're so poignant for what's going on in the United States right now. What's, what we see playing out against statues and against, you know, building names, it's not about necessarily that particular statue. It's about this idea that we have to start being honest about our own history. We have to start being honest about who we were, who we are, and who we want to be, you know, uh, the idea. I think many Americans would say, well, I want us to have a just society. But the problem is, is there's no analysis of what that means. Like, what does that mean? And how, and if, if we want to get there, how do we get there without first knowing where we're at? Because where we're at, it is in an incredibly dishonest place, mm. right? We, we haven't been honest about our own history. And so there can be no future, there can be no forward movement without first figuring out where you're at. So. And that's partly, again, you know, just to reiterate, that's partly a function of who we think we have been. Right. Right. So all of that stuff, past, present, future is all 
really interconnected with one another, the threads of those kinds of things. And, and memory is the effort that we take to try to tell the story of who we think we are. But it, memory is also about uh, prediction and, and hope, right? So memory and hope are really tied together. In, in, uh, I, and I think that that's what you kind of see in these episodes is that what might be in the future is really conditioned by the stories that we're allowed to be able to tell about the past. And, you know, there's something, it's just struck me, there's something really meta going on about uh, digital antiquities, right? Because they're actually digging through the past to help them see what's going on in the future. I mean, like physically digging through the trash of the past. Yeah. So <laughs> there's something really meta about that, about like these are all these sort of thrown away memories, Um and they're using that to define their future via yeah. their their memory. Yeah, so. yeah no, uh, digital antiquities is, 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 you know, short. It's like, I think it's even less than 15 minutes. And so it's, uh, it's short, but fun. Uh, and uh, there's just, you know, the, 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 the CGI and the set building and the simplicity of the story is uh, really powerful. And the acting is really great, the way that they're able to sort of show you know, this kind of confusion and frustration with one another, but at the end in which they're both looking at these photos and realizing who they are and this kind of like dawning kind of awakeness that they are looking at each other and realizing that they are half brother and sister um, was really, really powerful. So yeah, um, uh, I think that that's what's kind of cool about these, uh, this series is that it uh, brought some really talented people to be able to uh, get us to think about these things that have continual resonance with the cultural war uh, issues that we're dealing with and are, that are becoming even more and more heated as 2020 progresses. I agree. Yeah. Well, good. Um, this was a good discussion. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Always a pleasure to, to uh, uh, watch some cool stuff with you. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, and thank you all for coming and joining with us. Uh, leave us a comment and let us know what you think. Uh, we will link to the episodes and you can take a uh, look at them and join the conversation about uh, what you think about the way cultural memory and identity is portrayed in these different episodes. Drop us a line. Uh, you can check out some of the other episodes that we have done uh, about future states and let us know what you think about those issues. Uh, and help us to sort of think about what might be ways to think about the way justice is portrayed in these sci-fi speculative fiction episodes. We'll continue uh, uh, building on some of these episodes in the next few weeks, but thanks for listening, uh, and we hope that you will join us. You can find us on um, on our channel here on YouTube or on SoundCloud if you're listening to the audio podcast. Uh, you can also find us on a variety of social media on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and our webpage is anaresproject.org. So hopefully see you again soon, Robin. See you. All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>